Hi there guys, Tom Coyle here. Hope everybody's doing really well. Uh, first of all, let me just apologize slightly for not releasing anything but gear demos for quite some time now on this channel. Basically for a long time, I was doing the uh, gig for Dawson's where I was producing all of their demo content, all their review content. And so it was kind of the easy thing to do to transition into doing that kind of content at home as well, because eventually when the pandemic happened, um, well, when it started back in March, I ended up having all the gear set up at home, which is still set up now, which is what I'm using here. And it was an easy thing to do to transition into doing those videos. And it really allowed me as well to exercise my video production skills later down the line as well. So I've been doing a lot of that stuff and I will continue to do those on the channel as well, because I really enjoy doing them and they're great videos to do. And, you know, I like reviewing and demoing products that I'm really into. Um, and I get to work with some really great companies and some really great people as well. So we'll keep doing those. But two things have changed since then. The first is I'm no longer doing any work for Dawson's. Um, basically, Dawson's went into administration. And just before that happened, I decided I'd had enough of producing review videos, um, you know, five, six of those a week for two. I did it for two and a half years. It was great fun, really, really fantastic. But, um, you know, I'd had enough of doing that. I wanted to concentrate more on my own stuff. So I stopped doing that. And secondly, about... Four months after that happened, my daughter started school. She was at nursery, but she's only at school, uh, sorry, nursery for two days a week. So she started school and now she's there five days a week. I have quite a lot more time to work on my own stuff. So the combination of those two things has allowed me to start producing my own content for YouTube again. And I plan on doing a lot more because I love producing videos like this. It's really, really great. But this series of videos, I'm gonna do some tuition material and this is gonna be shorter videos, not too short, I want you to get you know, a decent amount of material here, but they're going to be shorter videos that kind of link to stuff that's in my lesson packages or some extra stuff that's not in those, which is what we're going to talk about today. But just give you guys some tips and some help with some of the techniques that people struggle with, but maybe things that people don't talk about too much. Um, so this first one is going to be about legato. Surprise, surprise. Of course it is because I'm a legato player. That's what I do. I'm not going to teach you about picking because I suck at it. But yeah, it's a legato kind of idea. But it's, again, something that people don't talk about too much when they're talking about this technique. And this is something that I call the lazy first finger syndrome. Okay. Now, the lazy first finger syndrome refers to this idea as this weird inbuilt sort of irony or, you know, idea that people don't think of so much that the finger that you wouldn't expect to be a problem for your legato technique actually is, and it's this first finger. Now, again, it's not very intuitive or sort of counterintuitive to think of your first finger as being the problem because for most people, myself included, it's the one that does the least. But of course, as I mentioned slightly ironically, that is the thing that causes the problem because we are doing way more work on developing the coordination and the strength of the second, third, and fourth fingers when we do our legato. And effectively what most people do when they use this first finger is they plant it on a string and it only moves when it changes string, fairly obviously. But people are not actually practicing the dexterity, control, and ability to really make that first finger do what you want it to do, and not just have it be this byproduct of string changes. And I often find with students who are trying to learn my style of legato, which is obviously sort of my style, it's an amalgamation of lots of other people like Greg Howe, um, Alan Hines, Alan Holdsworth, all of these guys, Brett Garstead, of course. Um, sorry if I missed your favorite player. Trust me, I probably love their legato playing. Um, it's, it's an amalgamation of all of these things, but it's very in time. So when I play legato, I'm not doing this liquidy kind of um, sound that's all over the bar in terms of the subdivisions. It's very in time. <laughs> Now this means that all of your string transitions have to happen really, really in time. Or what you're going to find is that as you transition to a new string, potentially with that first finger, you're going to push yourself ever so slightly out of time. And that's going to cause you to, to have a weird kind of sensation of losing grip of the control of your lines. You're going to feel like you're pushing and pulling all the time and you're not fully in control. And there's a level of satisfaction that you feel and a sense of um, confidence in your playing when you can fully control the string changes and fully control the subdivision really, really well with this legato technique. Now, as I mentioned, slightly ironically, the finger that's causing the problem for a lot of people is the first finger because that's usually the finger that people transition to a new string with. And I wanna show you something that might be quite revealing to some of you guys who've never thought about this before. 
If you practice basic legato kind of ideas just on a single string, let's say three note per string, let's take a classic kind of phrase like, for instance, on the high E string. Now, remember guys, if you don't know, or, or if you don't know, I should say, I have an F string here. So what I'm gonna do is gonna be a fret lower than what you're gonna do. I'm gonna take the eighth, ninth, and sorry, eighth, what am I on about? Sixth, seventh, and ninth frets. I've reached 40 and I can't count anymore. Sixth, seventh, and ninth frets on the high E string, my F string. You're gonna be a fret higher than that to match my notes. So you're gonna be on seven, eight, and 10. Really simple, like 101 legato thing. We're just gonna hammer on and then pull off all the way up that kind of set of notes. Don't worry about the speed of this. Don't worry about the accuracy of it at this point. What I want you to do is to pay really close attention to my first finger. Now, if you were paying close attention, and I had the close-up camera, so it should have been dead easy to see what was going on, you'll have noticed my first finger was not planted on the fret the entire time or on that high E string. It was actually lifting off and back on again. Now, I want you to do a little experiment. This might feel super weird at first if you've never done this before. What I want you to do is to plant your finger down onto that fret and keep it down and then execute your hammer-ons and pull-offs, which is the more kind of traditional way of doing this. It's the way it's traditionally taught. Your first finger is an anchor point from which the other fingers derive their strength in order to do the hammer-ons and the pull-offs. Okay, I'm positing that this is actually a bad idea. This is gonna introduce tension into your hand, and it's also gonna make you develop lazy first finger syndrome. So here it is with the finger planted down. What's hilarious about that is I can see my first finger knuckle joint wiggling because it desperately wants to release itself from the fret, or the string, I should say. Now, I feel way more tension through my hand when I'm doing that because I'm having to anchor this first finger down and then keep that as an anchor point to execute the other notes. And I'm also feeling more rotation of my palm happening, which is not a good idea for legato technique. You don't wanna be doing this kind of rocking motion when you're actually executing this technique. Now, try the same thing. And if you've never done this before, you may have to do it way slower. Try the same thing, but release the first finger at the optimum point. And of course, you can't release it until that second finger's gone down. Now, when I do this, I feel way less tension in my hand and through my fingers than I do if, than if I keep the first finger on, I should say. I find this way easier to execute. And it also means that at any point I need to do a string transition, let's say I was gonna play like an A major scale three note per string here. If I keep my first finger planted down and then execute these next two hammer-ons, in this case, this will be the fifth fret, seventh fret, and ninth fret of the E string. So pick hammer, hammer. If I keep that first finger down at the very last second, just before I need this note, I have to quickly transition that first finger. I have to release it from the string, move it through the air, and then place it down on that fifth fret of the A string, which is the next note, the note D. However, if you release the first finger, two things happen. Now, you don't have to release it a long way, just release the pressure from the string. Now that first finger is in a kind of prone position, it's got potential energy that you can use and exploit to bring it down onto that fifth fret of the A string in time, in control. That's the point. You're not suddenly switching to it. You're super, super in control over this movement. And the other thing is there's actually less tension in the hand. Try, try and just keep all of your fingers down on the fretboard, five, seven, and nine, and feel the tension through the hand. And now just allow the first and second fingers to release, or at least the first finger. And you'll feel some of that tension, at least unless I've got hands that are completely weird, which is quite possible. Um, I don't have massive fingers either, so that could be a potential factor in this. But for me, and for other people I've spoken to, like Martin Miller I've spoken to about this, I believe I've spoken to Andy Wood about this as well. David Beebe, a great friend of mine who has got a great legato technique as well. Um, 
I think all of us release that first finger as we're actually playing. So this is kind of an interesting thing. And I know Martin and I talked about this quite a lot. And he mentioned he didn't do this at first. And now this helps him a great deal when he's doing legato. Watch Rick Graham as well. Rick does this a great deal. You'll see that first finger coming on and off as he's playing. So it kind of, instead of looking like this, where that first finger is acting as an anchor point, it looks like this. Sorry. It's kind of weird to do slowly, but when you play a bit quicker, you can see that first finger moving. Now again, watch, I'm looking at this camera now just because I want to, you guys to kind of see this view. I'm gonna play some lines and watch my first finger. There is a lot of movement in this first finger as I improvise through some of these legato lines. It is not this kind of static thing that's never moving. It's got a lot of energy and a lot of movement in it. And therefore, as I do these string transitions, my first finger is not lazy, it's fully active. It's as active as my other fingers in some ways, if not more so in some cases. And therefore, every time I do a string transition, every time I need to move to a new string, it's fully engaged, fully active, it's not getting lazy. I'm developing the ability to actually move around in time with control of all four fingers, not just these three. Uh, or in some cases just these two, because the little one tends not to work for a lot of people as well. So I'm just going to improvise around C minor again. <laughs> So, hopefully that gives you some kind of an idea. Now, if you want to practice this in isolation, there are quite a few things you can do, actually. You can basically take some string skipping ideas are really useful for this, for transitioning that first finger and getting really, really good at working that first finger movement in kind of interesting ways. So, for instance, one of the ways that you could do this would be to take an idea like the minor pentatonic scale. So if we take C minor, <laughs> and just isolate this first finger movement. So I'm gonna go, uh, in, in this case, we'll talk fret numbers again. So eight, 11 on the low E. Then I'm gonna transition, I'm basically gonna play this phrase. You can see this first finger is transitioning between the strings and I have to keep it active in order to be able to execute this well. So I'm gonna go eight, 10, sorry, eight, 11, eight on the low E string. Uh, sorry, 8, 11 on the low E string, then 8 on the A string. Then I'm going to come back down the 11th fret and the 8th fret and pull off on the low E. And it's this constant... If you watch the first finger, if I do this slowly, you'll see it's constantly active. Now, one other thing I should say is that I'm executing the notes on the A, D, and G strings with my middle finger, so I'm hybrid picking. You don't have to do that at all. It's kind of useful. You could pick those. I can't. I'm, I suck at picking. So I have to do um, pick, hammer, middle, pick, pull off. Those kind of exercises will allow you to work on that first finger and keep it very, very active. Um, Anything like that, that has that first finger moving around in isolation is gonna be really, really good for you. And of course you could combine that with any kind of legato phrase you wanted to. The key here is to really focus on that first finger and moving it to the new string accurately and in time, but also this idea that this first finger does not always have to be a pivot point that is always down until the last possible second. Now there are, just the final thing in this video, there are quite a few people out there who probably would contend this issue or would, or would see this as being a problem because they use their first finger as a muting point for the string above, if you like, or the, the string that's pitch-wise lower but is physically above them on the fretboard. So what I mean by that is if they're playing a line on the G string, their first finger will be physically touching the string below. Now I get around that problem by just having very efficient right-hand muting on the strings that I'm not playing.
And also having a, um, a hybrid kind of technique allows you to do this a little bit more easily because your hand is generally close to the fretboard and remaining static. So again, as far as the, um, the right hand technique goes here, if, you, if I play again, just one more line if I improvise, you'll notice my right hand is not moving a great deal due to the hybrid picked kind of nature of the lines I play. And I will do some more videos on this at some point as well, actually, during in this series. Um, but if you watch the, the right hand, without, you know, not moving it too much is allowing me to really focus on the muting that's going on. So I'll do this one more time again in C minor. <laughs> So there we go. That's it for this lesson. I'm no way saying you have to do this. This is not something that has to be done to have good legato technique, but it's really helped me and lots of other people I know to get rid of that lazy first finger syndrome, or at least to be aware of it so that you're not constantly anchoring all the time. So I really, really hope that's useful, guys. If you did find this useful, or if you did enjoy this at all, um, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons below and hit the bell notification icon. Then you know every time I upload a video, you'll be notified and you'll see both the gear demos and some more of these videos coming very, very soon as well. And of course, you can elaborate yourself or, you know, I will elaborate on a lot of these concepts in my legato lessons that are on my website. So I have modern legato parts one, two, and three available, which basically go through my technique in a modern kind of sense, this idea of playing legato in time, playing and improvising all of these lines, um, going through basically how to execute all the subdivisions using hybrid picking, and also, you know, developing the, the pure fundamental technique and control over the technique. And then in Modern Legato Part 3, I go through how to improvise using these kind of lines and have the same level of technique when you improvise as you do when you play predetermined things. And then I have the Ultimate Legato Practice Toolkit, which is basically four uh, practice sessions that you can take and learn and utilize as 20 minute uh, chunks of time where you can really work efficiently on your legato practice. And I think it's a really good setup, even if I do say so myself, it's been very popular, very successful. So I think a lot of people have got a lot out of it. So check that out on my website as well. Links will all be below. And as I say, hope you find that useful guys. Stay tuned for lots more content like this, lots more lesson stuff coming up and more playing stuff as well as the gear demos. Thanks for watching guys. Thanks for all the support over the years and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.